Hello and welcome. Welcome to a brand new series of the IPSA seminar series. IPSA is the International Peace College South Africa, based here in Cape Town, and I'm the principal, Sheikh Ihsan Talib. Over a number of years, we have been conducting seminars, uh, colloquia, uh, on pertinent issues that address and find itself uh, emerging in the Muslim community, as well as in our society at large, both nationally and internationally. Uh, the purpose also why we address these issues is because of the importance of reflecting uh, on a middle way perspective examination. Uh, the middle way perspective and examination we believe is the typical Quranic perception of how we ought to evaluate matters in our lives. Um, last uh, few days we've been having wonderful conversations about an important issue uh, known as the phenomenon of ISIS. Uh, this is on the basis of the establishment, so-called establishment of a caliphate that had happened in the Muslim world. who had convened a, a colloquium and at the colloquium had wonderful presenters uh, from inter of international repute. With us in the studio here today, we have one such scholar, Dr. Jasir Ouda, who joined us. Dr. Jasir Ouda is an expert in the field of the philosophy of Islamic law and the Maqasid al-Sharia or more commonly known as the higher purposes of the Islamic law. We say unto Dr. Jasir Ouda, welcome Dr. Jasir Ouda. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh Hassan, Zakallah khair. And it's a pleasure to be here again in this beautiful country, South Africa, and a beautiful town, Cape Town, and uh, with all the brilliant students and scholars of IPSA. I really Thank enjoyed uh, myself in the past few days. Thank you very much. Dr. Jasir, to come to the uh, topic of our discussion, um, we of course find that internationally in the news, in the international media, uh, this is a topic that receives a lot of coverage. Um, something that I fear sometimes doesn't receive the same amount of coverage is when leading bodies and leading scholars from around the Muslim world uh, present their views and issue statements, uh, contextualizing and placing this phenomenon within a far more authentic and inter integral um, uh, position within the corpus of Islamic law. Uh, some of these bodies include the International Union of Muslim Scholars, of which incidentally you're also a member, uh, as well as locally we look at the Muslim Judicial Council here at the Cape, of which I happen to be a member as well. And so we find that uh, statements are issued, uh, really uh, distancing itself of this particular emergence, uh, also condemning uh, the atrocities and uh, barbaric uh, conduct that sometimes seem to become norm within the context of this particular uh, phenomenon. Dr. Jasir, uh, inform us a little bit more about the rationale as to why uh, there seems to be this contrast. The leading religious bodies giving a very clear uh, directive in terms of the Islamic law pertaining to this particular uh, phenomenon and when it comes to the international media it seems that this is portrayed as being part of Islam. Yeah, well uh, unfortunately most of the international media uh, are not interested in the truth. Uh, they are interested in making a story that brings viewers and uh, brings all of these uh, loud noises that uh, make them sell their stories. Uh, in that context, I really appreciate Dean TV for giving us that space to talk about the truth that matters in these issues and how the scholars of Islam are dealing with that issue that claiming to be an Islamic issue. Um, mentioning the International Union of Muslim Scholars, of which actually both of us are members, Sheikh Ihsan, uh, we issued a strong statement uh, in the name of all the 90,000 scholars who are uh, active members or affiliated with the International Union uh, saying that uh, these atrocities are not Islamic and uh, the claim of a khilafah is not shari. There are certain conditions in our fiqh that every student of knowledge knows about a khilafah. Uh, it has to do with the conduct of the khalifa and with uh, the moral and ethical uh, content of the ruling system of that khilafah uh, before we can call it a khilafah, not any you know, gang of, of people that makes themselves uh, claim to be a khilafah and just wear you know, these uh, b black thobes and whatever and then they or, or, or wave a black flag 
And this becomes a khilafah. Khilafah has a number of conditions. The International Union of Muslim Scholars judged that uh, these, these people claiming to have formed a khilafah do not meet these conditions, and therefore they are a false uh, khilafah in that sense. Uh, I'm also a member of the European Council uh, in, of Fatwa, for Fatwa, and we issued a similar statement condemning in the strongest terms uh, all of these atrocities, uh, especially the one that happened in Europe, uh, which, which ISIS calls the, the lone wolf, uh, whatever, uh, jihad that they, are, they had issued, uh, saying that this is unacceptable for peaceful cities uh, in Europe, and Paris and London, in, in Berlin to see violence that are uncalled for against innocent people. Uh, all of that was uh, unacceptable and un-Islamic before it is unacceptable on a yes. human level. Um, so it, it is also very important to uh, listen to the true voice of Islam rather than the voice that makes a story. Yes. And it is very important for our viewers and our brothers and sisters in Islam to know that not anybody who self-claimed to be Muslim self claim to be a Khalifa or to be a representative of something Islamic. Uh, not anybody is, is right in what they are saying and is truthful. And there is a lot of falsehood right. in the name of Islam. I think, uh, Dr. Jasser, in uh, of course, the responsibility that are borne by these uh, bodies, whether they're international, uh, local, in our context here. Uh, I think the trend that you will normally find that will find itself uh, wove, or weaving, weaving itself through all of these uh, um, uh, institutions and the statements that they make is obviously uh, the, the more mainstream position of, 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 of Wasatiya, which is a Quranic concept, also a prophetic tradition uh, in terms of the Hadith, a concept which is really founded uh, within our understanding. Uh, and so the middle way approach is obviously for us always that mainstream approach as opposed to uh, these more extreme expressions obviously uh, that we sometimes find as you correctly I think indicate uh, results from a lack of understanding, a lack of, 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 of knowledge etc. Mm -hmm. So if we are talking about a far more uh, sort of mainstream and a sort of middle way approach which is, an, which is the Islamic approach how would we be viewing then, Dr. Jasir, um, you know, this uh, phenomenon uh, from a more uh, sort of uh, uh, jurisprudential perspective, etc.? Yeah. Actually, the middle way approach uh, is the original Islamic approach. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَسَطَى We made you a nation of a middle way or mm -hmm. a middle path. Mm -hmm. This is the straight path that we pray for that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to in every salah guide us to the straight path. The straight path is the middle path. Unfortunately, we have two extremes that we live in today's world and both find their way, as we were saying, loudly in the media. And the middle way appears to be silent, uh, even though it is not, but may, perhaps it doesn't make as a, an exciting of a story. The, the two extremes are the extreme of uh, literalism uh, that stops at the letter, stops at some forms, uh, historic forms of government, historic forms uh, of society that we had uh, in our history, and especially in our down times uh, of the Islamic history. And we stop at that, we imitate that without looking at the contemporary times and what it means to be Muslim today. And we claim that this is Islamic. And on the other extreme, we have a so-called liberal voice or critical voice that critiques even the fundamental parts of Islam, the faith issues that every Muslim should believe in, the faith articles. Uh, a middle path is, is a path that balances the fixed parts of Islam and the variable parts, mm. balances the divine parts and the human-made uh, parts. Uh, the middle path of Islam is a path that is ethical, moral, that puts morality and principles at the top uh, priority and the top consideration when it comes to an Islamic view. So when you form an Islamic view in a middle way, you have to look at issues of justice, issues of wisdom, uh, issues of uh, people's welfare. Imam ibn al-Qayyim, for example, one of the great scholars of Islam, he said Sharia ah is all about justice, is all about wisdom, is all about uh, mercy, and is all about good. 
And therefore, any ruling that takes Sharia from being about justice to being about injustice is a ruling that does not belong to the Sharia. Ah, and any ruling that takes Sharia ah from being about mercy to being about cruelty is a ruling that does not belong to the Sharia. Ah. Yes. And any ruling that takes Sharia ah from being about good to being about mischief is a ruling that does not belong to the Sharia. Ah. Right. So the middle path puts these principles uh, in, the, in, in the top consideration when we try to judge something yes. as Islamic or not. So what we see in the media, and on YouTube, and all of these atrocities mm. that are committed in the name of Islam, are they justice? Are they merciful? Are they wise? Mm. Uh, and are they good? And with, with a common sense, without even getting in, into all of these sophisticated yeah. juridical, ju juridical uh, rules and fundamentals, we can judge that killing people this way, innocent journalists, innocent people, um, clean, ethnic cleansing a minority just because they are Christians, uh, peaceful, everything, going about their lives, right. and, and enslaving people in today's world, and all of that. This is un-Islamic. Right. But we, we need to, as I'm saying, go beyond the form and the labels and the false attires and the false outlook and the words, yes. using all of these Islamic and Arabic words, go beyond that to the essence of Absolutely. what these guys are doing. Yeah. Is this Islamic? No, it is not. Therefore, we should not call it uh, Islamic. It is not Islamic. It's not a state to start with, given any definition of a modern state. But it's not Islamic either. It's not Islamic. No. I think, Dr. Jasser, in terms of just uh, uh, you know, uh, locating the, the principles of justice within Islam, um, it is telling that um, uh, many a text in the Holy Quran itself uh, really tempers notions of justice with kindness and goodness notions of justice with um, um, a sense of, of humanity mercy. And, so, and mercy. And so uh, very explicitly in the Holy Quran, we find reference to inna Allah ya'amru bil adil wal ihsan. And so the whole notion of justice, which is adil, uh, of necessity needs to be tempered and always conjoined with al ihsan, which is of the widest sort of connotations of goodness, kindness, humanity, even in a sense. And so when we see that those uh, values are trampled underfoot, I think then we should be uh, alarmed at why uh, do we find uh, visuals and imagery that want to portray uh, an outward impression or an outward picture uh, on the basis of symbols, on the basis of clothes, on the basis of appearances, that it is Islam, but it's void of the very values, it's void of the very ethics of Islam. And so I think uh, for us, obviously, especially to our young people, as you say, Dr. Jasser, I think many times um, really the disservice that, that the international or, or rather the more mainstream media does to uh, this middle voice is that it uh, buries uh, really the voice of rationale, it, it buries the voice of wisdom, and it yeah. buries the voice of reason. And so I think it's, it's probably also one of those, as you've mentioned, one of the classical scholars, uh, Ibn Qayyim al Jawzi, uh, in his works that relate more particularly to uh, Islamic politics, for example, uh, he uh, very clearly juxtaposes uh, the extremes, uh, of course, that, 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 that would highlight what is uh, Islamic and what is not Islamic. Mm -hmm. And so, really, as I think you've also mentioned, it's about uh, you know, not elevating uh, the form of something or its shape or its appearance above its essence it's, yes, and it's, its concept. It's, it's. And, and I think that unfortunately is where many of our own communities uh, sort yeah. of fall short because also as a result of the disservice uh, that we find in, in the media outlets. Something important as well for our community here in South Africa, uh, Muslim and non-Muslim, for people of South Africa to know as well. Perhaps uh, many of them are uh, so far from the Arab world, they don't know the, the details, the intricacies, and the complexity in the Arab world. Um, ISIS, ISIL, Daesh, whatever you want to call it, is a symptom rather than mm. a problem in its own right. Mm. And when the real problems disappear from the Arab world, Daesh will disappear. It is a symptom of a lot of oppression from regimes that have been ruling this part of the world for decades, sometimes centuries, in a very oppressive style. And then recently, on top of that, occupation from foreign forces and foreign countries 
that come and open prisons wide for thousands of people, torture them, etc. Uh, problems of oppression, problems of poverty and economic marginalization. We have so many billionaires in the Arab world, but we have so many millions mm. uh, and hundreds of millions in, in front of them mm. who are poor and hungry. We have hunger problems now in places like Egypt and Libya and, and Tunisia. And, and it's amazing, some of these are oil-rich countries like Libya or Algeria. You find hunger problems, or even Dubai, and the, what is that? Uh, this, all of these problems caused a lot of youth to be very angry and to feel marginalized and to feel that they want to make the strongest possible statement against their society. And before that, we have a problem in the understanding of Islam. We have a major lack in Islamic thought uh, and major lack in propagating that moderate and mature and modern and contemporary Islamic thought to the youth educational systems that are in most part uh, failures, uh, schools that do not do their duty in educating the children in most parts of the Arab world, um, a failure educational system, a, many social problems that were left without uh, remedies from the state institutions, civil society that is not allowed to function, accused of treason, accused of whatever, and therefore civil society not even allowed to remedy the state's shortcoming. And all of these problems created uh, these youth, many of them with good intentions, but good intentions do not uh, prevent a person from being a criminal. Right. And, and therefore we have this mafia in the Arab style that went and created that so-called so state, and in the name of that state, trying to reform. But I think soon in, and very early in their experience, they are realizing that without proper thought and without the principles of justice and principles of a modern state uh, that, that they're claiming to be, they wouldn't be able to sustain themselves. Uh, they are falling into all sorts of crimes. Many of them are defecting now from the ranks of ISIS, ISIL, Daesh going back to their countries and narrating how uh, misguided they were. Uh, but unfortunately, many other kids, youth, are joining them from Europe, from yes. Asia, from the rest of the world, America, unfortunately, leaving their own societies. No. But again, if you look at some of these youth, the, the three girls from England recently, or the other guys from the US, and you look at their lives, their lives themselves were not very balanced lives. Uh, they were themselves marginalized in their own countries, UK or Germany or in the Balkans. Uh, they themselves did not have rights as communities, and that is part of the problem. Mm. So oppression from the Arab regimes, marginalization in European societies, um, failures in, in some of the Balkan states, uh, extremism in, in places like the Philippines or Malaysia, where some of the other kids uh, leave their societies and go and join Daesh. Mm. All of this is creating this problem. And without tackling the real issues uh, in Islamic thought and how we approach Islam, we will not be able to solve this problem. Absolutely. And so young people, obviously, in their desperation, uh, anything true. that seems to be uh, presenting itself as uh, some uh, indication towards some solution, uh, obviously, to the real life issues, socioeconomic, educational, uh, political issues obviously they face on a daily basis seems uh, perhaps alluring and attractive to, to, to follow. Yeah. Dr. Jassir, you've, you've obviously touched now on uh, also the areas which we've began to uh, identify uh, in need for further examinations which uh, are these geopolitical uh, of course uh, elements and complexities uh, that, that we have uh, playing itself out within the Muslim world. Um, one thing which I also want to reference is it, it is very telling uh, in one of the uh, publications of a uh, analyst, author, uh, journalist uh, by the name of Graham Fuller. Uh, he wrote a book wherein, uh, which he titles A World Without Islam. And uh, in his final analysis of this particular work, he basically comes to the conclusion that if we suppose that there was no religion such as Islam existent in the world today, his theory is that there would have been no difference in the relations between as they exist politically today between the West and the Middle East. So he says that there are 
issues that are at play that bring about the kind of foreign policy influences from Western countries towards the Middle East uh, that is really unrelated to Islam. And so I think without us also, uh, you know, beginning to delve into those kinds of uh, complexities, again, uh, it, it, it should be what, what becomes part of a middle, a middle road response, a middle road mm -hmm. examination. Otherwise, we are looking at, perhaps as you've indicated, many of the symptoms and many of the, uh, you know, unintended things that arise, as opposed to also uh, having a, a keen look at the, well, the, the causes. I, I do agree with Graham Fuller's thesis that uh, the Western hegemony in, in the Middle East is a matter of oil, uh, is a matter of resources, is a matter of strategy, uh, to dominate uh, the world, the empire seekers in America, especially from the conservative side, uh, are trying to build a bigger empire. I, I do agree with this analysis that uh, Islam as Islam is not really uh, a big part or a part of the problem. But, uh, but I, I think that Islam as Islam is a major part of the solution. Yeah. And without Islam, we would not be able to solve the problems in the Middle East because Islam is the reference of most people in the Middle East and without an Islamic approach that is balanced and contemporary we will not be able to resolve the problems and Islam is compounding the problem or rather Islamic thought wrong Islamic thought mm. misapplication of Islam is compounding the problem from our side as Muslims because so many Muslims in the name of Islam join these uh, deviant the groups and, and so on, and they take different forms, and they cause so much harm in our societies. Uh, and so many rulers and tyrants in the name of Islam too, they continue uh, their uh, autocratic ways of ruling us in, in the Middle East, in the Arab world, and uh, they continue with their uh, totalitarian systems and totalitarian yes. countries, uh, totalitarian systems of government, yes. Uh, in the name of Islam yes. too and claiming to be representatives of Islam and they are not yes. uh, either because Islam is very democratic if you wish uh, very the, the Islamic world would be Shura Islam is based on Shura as a public system yeah. um, the problem is that we have some landmines in the Islamic thought field that we need to clear before we are able to tackle that problem uh, a lot of what Daesh is relying on is Islamic, but it's wrong. But it's Islamic in the sense of it is somewhere in our history said that uh, we have to uh, kill people for ridda, apostasy, or whatever. And then who is an apostate? Is anybody who goes against their views in yes. any shape or form. And then they come up with this funny uh, qaida or fundamental rule that says قتال المرتد أولى من قتال الكافر that right. they're saying we have to fight the apostates before we fight the disbelievers yes. uh, and the infamous saying of their Khalifa Baghdadi when he said if we go to Gaza we will fight Hamas before we fight Israel oh. because Hamas are apostates but Israel right. are kuffar and we have to kill the apostates before we kill the kuffar and right. so we do have these wrong uh, uh, rules that that some people claim to be Islamic that we need to deal with as scholarly bodies and yes. as institutions like IPSA in our research and in our classroom and so that we remove this from the Islamic right. thought so that we have an Islamic thought that is part of the solution that right. rather than part of the problem uh, and I'm so glad that we are talking about that in, ter in terms of IPSA and you know, the new seminar series that we are planning and the new programs that we're planning together. Dr. Jasser, thank you for those insights. We've come more or less to the end of the program. Um, I think uh, it would be wonderful in our next session to pick up on some of these issues and uh, particularly, as you've mentioned, um, the political agendas that uh, many times become conflated and uh, couched into religious uh, you know, values and terms by these very uh, perpetrators of these agendas. And I think those obviously, I think the uh, final uh, sort of points that I think we would want to conclude on, uh, we don't have 
uh, more time today uh, for, for, for those discussions. But until the next time when we do continue with our conversation, thank you very much for joining us My and uh, uh, wonderful to have you with us. Thank, thank you, Dr. Thank Jasser. You, thank you, Chef Hassan. Uh, we say thank you to all our viewers uh, for joining us here uh, on the IPSA seminar series. Until we meet with you again, uh, good evening, good day. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.